Hi everyone, welcome to our new video series. My name is Jan Gustafsson and I'm thrilled to be reunited with fellow Magnus Carlsen's trainers, seconds, Peter Heine Nielsen, Magnus Carlsen's head coach and Laurent Fressinet, Magnus Carlsen's French coach, are both here and we will be going through the World Championship match 2021. Our experiences with it, the games, what we prepared, where we felt things went well, where we felt things didn't go well. Peter, we have different perspectives because we were in different locations. Very much. I'm looking forward to talking to you guys about it because you were in Thailand during all the match and I was in Dubai with the Magnus and the you know, his non-chess team. So I see some kind of debriefing where we will discuss what was the mood in Dubai, what was happening in the technical department in Thailand and we got to sort of basically compare notes and uh, yeah, get the two kind of inside looks uh, from the match. Very much so. And Laurent, we are actually in your private home. Thanks for having us. It's a big pleasure to, to welcome both of you. And I'm sure it will be interesting to talk to you guys about the match. Likewise. So we hope you guys enjoy the series with our behind the scenes insights. <laughs> See you then.
for women leader. Eva, thank you very much for everything you do. That is really appreciate. Um, she's recording not only in the, progress. Recording. Eva is not only the uh, Titan player, which we can talk a lot international master, women grandmaster, FIDE trainer, international organizer, FIDE women chairperson, ECU uh, vice president, but she is also a wonderful person um, who actively connects women in the world uh, and not only women. Eva is, Eva is finding the way that is actually um, working and progressing and women are benefiting uh, from it. And um, what I can say myself, I personally met Eva recently at, in Monaco at the European Chess Gala. And I really do believe that the right person is in the right place. And again, Eva, thank you very much for what you do for us and I hope for more. And now, off to you. Thank you, Agnieszka, for your introduction and for accepting to be our host uh, today. Uh, I would like to warmly welcome all participants and uh, I want to thank you all for joining our exchange forum. It's uh, very important uh, that uh, you help us with our mission uh, to connect and to share information. Uh, since uh, 2024 was declared the year of the woman in chess, we are very happy to see big interest, engagement and support uh, also by national federations uh, who are reaching out to us with their stories and their events. Uh, as I already mentioned, one of the important goals in our mission is to build global network to connect uh, women and chess uh, and their supporters. And uh, this forum is a very important step to achieve this goal. So again, uh, thank you for joining, and uh, we hope that this is just the beginning, and uh, our plan is to organize such forums throughout the year, uh, at, least, uh, at least three more of them, and uh, we will all inform you uh, early enough and, and send you the invitation, so I hope that we will meet each other repeatedly. Uh, today we have a very special guest uh, who will uh, present uh, an important research, and I'm giving fl the floor back to uh, Agnieszka to introduce him. Okay, a uh, key part of our meeting today is the presentation done by our special guest, David Smerdon. Uh, if you would have any question during the presentation, uh, please send them uh, to us via, via chat. Uh, and we will be presenting them after the presentation, when we will also have a discussion about the uh, topic and about the other matters. Uh, now I'm gonna help my little helper to read it, all the stuff about David because it's so much. <laughs> David, uh, Dr. David Smerdon is an Australian Grandmaster and an Assistant Professor of Economics at the University of Queensland. Uh, prior to this, he worked in Australia Department of the Treasury as a, a policy analyst, and David completed a PhD in economics at the University of Amsterdam, and his research focuses on the application of behavioral and development economics. Major component of David's research is about the effect of social uh, norm and what can be done to impl implement behavioral change with a diverse change range of applications such as female uh, circumcision in Somalia and refugee integration in rural Australia. Uh, cheating in chess and the gender gap in STEM fields. He is also the creator of the Fighting Chess Index, a measure of professional players' fighting spirit, which is being used to award bonus prizes in the current. Meltwater Chess Tour. David played seven Olympiads for Australia, drawing with Magnus Carlsen in his final appearance. His book, The Complete Chess Swindler, was the winner of the English Chess Federation Book of the Year in 2020. That is all very impressive, David, and I can't wait for your presentation. 
Thanks, Aga. Thanks very much for the introduction. Um, it's really nice to meet you all. Uh, here I am in my office in Brisbane, Australia, um, at the University of Queensland. Normally, I'm giving Zoom presentations to students in economics and, and business. So this is a really nice change for me. So thank you very much for the invitation. Um, a special shout out. I can see some, some men also on our Zoom chat. Shout out to you for joining. These are very important issues and I think we have a important role to play. So thank you for attending as well. Um, should I share my screen, Aga? Would that be the, I can do this? Yep, okay, perfect. Just one moment while I sort this out. Okay. Ah, one second. It's always tricky to make sure I'm sharing the right window rather than the background of my children on my <laughs> on my desktop instead. Okay, I think we are we are ready. Um, actually, it was through this um, forum that I got to know both um, Aga and, and Eva, and I think you're doing fantastic work. It's been really, really nice to meet you as well. Nice to chat to you. And it's pretty exciting to have a, a year for women in chess at FIDE's organizing. And I'm very interested to see what comes out of uh, not just these exchange forums, but also the whole, the whole program that's in place for 2022. It'd be nice in this year for us all to have a bit of good news. So I hope that this is uh, some uh, topic where we can see some progress. So the topic uh, that I chose to speak about when I initially sent a title to Eva is um, Facts and Myths About Gender in Chess. And the plan was to um, present a little bit of my own research. Uh, I work in behavioral economics, which is halfway between economics and psychology and some of the topics had to do with, with chess and particularly gender. But actually, over the past few weeks, I realized that my research is maybe not the most important thing for this sort of forum. Maybe a better idea is actually to give a little bit of a summary of all the research that's happening in academic communities about gender and particularly gender in chess, and then to talk a little bit about different policies for gender equality in situations similar to what we have in the chess world and to give you a little bit of a snapshot of the evidence of what works, what doesn't work so well. And then I'm going to make some recommendations based on this research that are perhaps a little bit extreme. So maybe we should just consider them as suggestions that I'm put forward, but they're all going to be based on some evidence uh and i'll sort of hopefully that will provoke some conversations some some food for thought and then we can uh see whether anything comes out of this okay so uh obviously in the chess world we love to talk about the gender gap and debate it everyone has an opinion on facebook and twitter about these things uh, i'm going to talk about it with a little bit of reluctance because I actually think the gap itself is really not the most important thing for the issues that most of us care about. But it's there and I think a lot of the time it's debated in the chess world without much um, reliance on evidence or, or data, just typically anecdotes and opinions. It's not to say that anecdotes are not important, they are, but uh, I will present anyway the evidence that we have in, in research about these things, particularly related to first participation and how the participation gap may affect the performance gap. Second, social factors that we know matter. And then third, about biological factors, perhaps the most controversial issue, so I won't spend too much time on it because I'm, I'm not typically a very controversial sort of person. And after that, I will then move on to Perhaps what's a little bit more important, in my opinion, which is the evidence about policies to do with gender. So pretty simple outline. And now I believe the plan is that you can write any chats that you have, uh, any chats, any questions that you have uh, in the chat. And then after this, I, I think there's going to be a lot of time for, for questions. And so um, those will hopefully be addressed and passed on to me. So feel free at any time to write anything 
uh, in the chat for questions, suggestions, clarifications, and so forth. Okay, so let's start with the first part then, the gender gap uh, in chess. What is the gender gap? I think we all know, but let's put the statistics on the table so we're all talking about the same thing. There are two parts of the gender gap. One is the performance gap and one is the participation gap. And they are quite closely connected. In fact, quite often people don't distinguish them and just talk about the gender gap in chess. But they are a little bit distinct. Performance is about this level effect. And typically we're looking at chess ratings as the key measure of that. And so on the right hand side, you can see here the statistics. Um, one out of the top 100 chess players uh, is female. Um, by the way, in this presentation, I will use the words female, woman interchangeably, which I think is not politically perfectly correct, but please ignore it uh, for the purposes of this presentation. So, so that's Ho Yi Fan, of course, uh, who is the one. Um, three out of the top 100 juniors uh, are girls. And of grandmasters, it's, it's 2%, about 2.3% um, who are female. Now, um, on the left-hand side, we have nothing about uh, performance necessarily, but about participation. And this is about the share of female players that we have uh, in the chess world at the moment. Now, if we look at the FIDE uh, master list, which includes Blitz and Rapid and has about 860,000 players, 16% are female. If we look just at the classical list, which was a bit smaller, it's about 350,000 players, it's 11%. Uh, and then I put something else on here, which is a little bit odd maybe, but uh, to say that there are some domains of the chess world uh, where we actually see a reasonably high share of females. Um, unfortunately for Twitch, the, the, uh, the streaming platform Twitch, uh, they were hacked and there was a data breach and the top earnings for the different domains were released into the public, which was terrible for them, but good for academics who like using data and one thing we can see from that is about the chess streamers that actually of the top 20, uh, seven are female and the Bote sisters are, are the number one of the female streamers there. And I've got these arrows in the middle as well because it's not totally clear which causes which or both. Now, it could be that the participation gap is a driving factor for why we see this performance gap right at the top and why we haven't had many female players right at the top. And that seems to be a reasonably intuitive story that we can all kind of understand. And the data uh, reflects that as well. But it could also be the other way to some extent as well. But the fact that we don't have these very top female players is actually uh, discouraging for girls wanting to get into chess, which is why we see a lower participation gap. So these things are very tricky to get a nice, clean answer about it. Now, this topic is something that I've, I've been interested in in a long time, being a chess player. And recently, I've been involved in a research project. Ho Yifan is on the project. It's, it's being driven um, by a, a very good professor, um, Wei Jin Ma from, um, uh, from New York, who, who wrote an article about this uh, on uh, the Chess Base website. I think it was one or two years ago, and a few other very good researchers. So we're we're trying to collect together as much data and different theories about this as possible. But most of this, like I said, is not, not super interesting to everyone. So I'm just going to, to focus on the key points about this. But let's start with, I guess, a kind of an important question, which is, are things improving over time? Are things getting any better? Well, we can have a look at the share of female players on the FIDE rating list and how it's changed over, say, the last 30 years or so. It's actually a, a bit of a bizarre graph because we can see that from 1990, the share of female players actually went down for a little period of time, all the way up until around the year um, 1999 uh, and 2000, when FIDE started to lower the rating floor. And that's what those vertical lines are here to represent when FIDE progressively lowered the rating floor. And I think it is kind of important to not uh to not ignore that because it probably has something to do with how the share changes over time so i've put those dotted lines there for i guess for transparency but then if we look at the right hand side after the last dotted line so we're now we're looking at the period where there are there are no more dotted lines you can see that from around about 2012-13 for the last 10 years or so 
there's actually been a steady increase uh, in every year of the share of women players, which is good news. But on the other hand, if you look at the scale, which I've got over on the left-hand side there, the numbers are still pretty small. So it's, it's going up, but it's going up pretty slowly at the moment. So I guess it's, it's half good news uh, in the sense that it seems to be moving in the right direction. But of course, we might be interested in how to speed this up in the future as well. So what do we know about the gender gap in chess? Well, I mentioned it a little bit earlier. Participation uh, explains most of the performance gap that we see at the, at the top. And this is pure statistics, basically. If you don't have many female players to begin with, you're not going to get very many right at the extreme end in you know, top 10, top 50, top 100 in the world. Now, this has been debated by statisticians for the last couple of decades. Uh, I won't go into this too much, but basically the conclusion is it explains most of the performance gap, but not all. And that's pretty clear. There's some left over and we don't know exactly what explains it, but there's definitely something that, uh, that has men performing better than women that can't just be explained by lower participation. But let's talk about participation for just a moment. There's strong evidence that girls drop out at faster rates than boys drop out of chess at all ages, not just at the start, but at all ages. And particularly around 16, 17, 18, it's particularly severe. Now there are a couple of theories for this, but I'll show you first the graph. So you see, um, you see what I mean? So this is the dropout rates by age. So this shows the share of women at every different age point. So you can see that, well, the, the data is not very reliable when we look at ages less than 10 because you don't have many FIDE rated players less than 10. So I've put it here anyway, but it's not super reliable, but basically 25% seems to be almost like a baseline. But then something happens at this dotted line, which is the age of 16, and it starts to decrease a lot. At some point, women actually catch up, but not until the age of 65, when it's probably got to do more with life expectancy than anything else. But in general, you can see that the drop-off just continues over time. But what I'm most interested in is why it's so steep around this 16, 17, 18 years of age. And anecdotal evidence and also evidence from some surveys that have been ran seem to suggest that it's around this period that girls leave the more comfortable environment of junior chess when there's going to be a lot more girls playing in, in schools they're going to have a bigger social group of other girls playing it's more likely that they will have more comfortable events at school tournaments and they have to go out on their own into the adult world seek out the local club where they're likely to be one perhaps the only female or one or only a few females there and so if you were to believe a story that social factors contribute to discouraging women from continuing with chess, then this graph is pretty consistent with that story. So those two things seem to go together. Okay, moving on from participation now with that nice segue to, to social factors, the evidence for academic research is pretty clear that social factors exist, not just from that graph I showed you, which was more suggestive, but from pretty strong um, and robust research studies that, I mean, I've done some studies, but many other people have done studies in different domains. And one of the reasons, well, one of the most uh, consistent findings is that even if the ELO ratings are the same, when a woman plays against a man, she plays worse than if she was playing against a woman, even of the same rating. And that suggests there must be something social going on because we've got the same ratings at this point in time. The difference is somewhere around 30 ELO points. And we can see it both by looking at their ELO performance data, but also comparing the quality of their moves to engine evaluations. When they play against a man, they play slightly worse. And there's also some evidence that men modify their playing style when facing a woman. They take longer to resign against women when they're in worse positions. And then one of the kind of, to me, one of the most bizarre studies that you would find out there in an economics journal, men play riskier openings when they're playing against attractive females. This was a study they did where they actually did surveys and they showed photos to people and got rankings of attractiveness. All of this, I mean, it's hard to know exactly what's going on with this sort of research, but one thing is clear that there seems to be some sort of social or environmental factors that are affecting women's performance, and even the way that men are playing as well. And what about biological factors, which I guess is, like I mentioned before, probably the most controversial element of this whole debate. Well, 
there is some evidence that biological factors should play a role and may affect the gap to some extent, but we don't really know exactly what or how much or in what way that they work. We do know one thing, this is some uh, ongoing research that I'm doing at the moment, a, a work in, in progress, that women and men have a similar life cycle of how their uh, chest strength goes over time. So at what age they start to peak, at what age their performance starts to drop off, that's pretty similar for men and women. And for men who have children and men who don't have children, so fathers and non-fathers, that life cycle looks pretty similar as well. But for women who have children, their life cycle looks a fair bit different to women who don't have children. Now, I don't know if you want to call this a biological factor or maybe a social factor, it's, you know, maybe just semantics at this point, but I'll show you this, like I said, is work in progress, but this is looking across, um, yeah, over 100,000 chess players. So it's a pretty big sample. If you look on the left-hand side, I don't want to give you too many academic graphs as we go through, but just on the left-hand side, you kind of can see that the two lines, they look pretty similar. So that's men with children and men without children. And generally speaking, they peak roughly around that um, 30 years of age and then a slow sort of decline. And for women, it's pretty similar. If you look on the right-hand side, that sort of um, top line, that gray line, it's reasonably similar. But then there's that black line on the right and that's mothers. And you can sort of see that around about that child rearing age when you've got young kids, for whatever reason, women's performance tends to go down relative to their peak a fair bit. I don't really know why we haven't got into that level of detail yet, but it seems to be somewhat clear. Just to finish off the biology debate, because we don't really know a lot about what's happening with biology when it comes to chess, but what can we say about biology in domains outside of chess and biological factors? Well, there's actually been a lot of research that's found some, some strong biological differences in some domains and also some domains where there's just no gender difference, such as intelligence, for example. But I'm going to give you three categories where there seems to be consistently clear differences around the world. The first is competitiveness. Uh, on average, girls are less competitive than boys. The second is preferences. Now, preferences goes to some of the surveys that have been conducted recently by um, different researchers and also Chess24 that seems to find differences in liking or enjoyment. And then the third is comparative advantage, which is a term from economics that's actually really important. And it's typically studied in the domain of looking at um, what sort of degree you go into or studies in high school, whether it's STEM fields, science, technology, engineering, mathematics, or something that's more in the reading, writing, and speaking domain, such as law, for example. And I'm going to show you some, some crazy graphs here in a second. I don't want to scare you too much because the, the, um, the font is very small, but I'll try to explain them because it's one of the most important graphs in the gender debate in social psychology. So that's why I'm putting them, them up in full. This is a graph here, very hard to read, I know, but this is a graph that shows the relative differences in strengths between boys and girls across all countries uh, in the world. This graph doesn't have all countries, but the study is across all countries. And this is the, the you've got the zero mark. You might be able to see it on the screen, uh, on the x-axis there, you've, on the bottom axis, you've got the zero and anything to the left hand side of that graph means girls are better in that country. Anything to the right hand side means boys are better. Red means girls are better at reading. So if you see a line that's a red line going to the left, it means in that country, girls are better than boys at reading, which you can see is, is most of them. The blue line is science. So anything to the left means girls are better than boys in science. Anything to the right means boys are better than girls in science. Uh, and the, uh, is it green? I'm colorblind actually, I think it's green, but it, that, it, that's mathematics anyway. So it's saying that anything to the left, girls are better in mathematics, anything to the right, boys are better. So we can see that it's actually mixed. Reading seems to be pretty consistent. But with the, the science, it's, it's not totally clear, and also with the mathematics. But then what the authors of this study did is they said, well, let's look at the, what they call the intra-individual differences. What that means is that they look at each individual boy or girl, and they try to work out what their strength is out of reading versus uh, science versus mathematics. So what's their personal strength, their comparative advantage? And when you do that graph, you can see it's now pretty clear across the world, 
girls are comparatively better at reading, boys are comparatively better at science and mathematics. So it's actually not the case that boys are absolutely better at science and math. It's actually quite mixed around the world with this. But given a choice between different careers, typically you choose something that you're relatively better at. And for the most part, girls are relatively better or stronger in, in reading and writing um, than boys are. So anyway, this is a big, this is a big debate, but perhaps it's got something to do, um, to do with chess and particularly some of these findings that the gender participation rate seems to be much lower in countries that are a little bit freer for women to choose different career paths. I don't know about this. What we don't know, well, like I mentioned before, we have no idea whether these biological differences that have been found in other domains have anything to do with chess. And one of the reasons we could actually be skeptical about this is that we've got such a, a relatively low share of females in the chess world that those women who do come into chess, stay in chess and excel in chess are probably the ones who are the most competitive women the ones who have a comparative advantage in the skills that make them good at chess and also have a preference and enjoyment, a love of the game that they can put up with being the only woman in the room because they just love chess so much. So even if there are these biological differences across the whole population, to be honest, I doubt whether it would have any big effect once we look in the chess world. And then I guess this is one of the big points I wanted to get across, which is I'm not really sure everything I just spoke about is actually that relevant. I mean, it is relevant to know these things. It's irrelevant to have data, to know what the research says, and to be able to put forward an intelligent and coherent argument when these issues are raised. But actually, imagine that it is the case that the natural rate in the world population for women playing chess is 25%. Imagine that's the case. Well, so what? It doesn't really change anything for what we should be doing going forward. We know that the current rate is something around 10 to 11%. And it's increasing only slowly and we want to speed it up so it probably doesn't change anything if there is a gender gap uh, no matter what that level is and so i suggest that we try to shift the focus away from these sort of more academic debates although it's very interesting to academics of course and move it towards well we all have one clear goal which is to boost chess participation surveys that have been done of male and female players around the world all seem to strongly suggest that everyone likes having women in the chess world, feels comfortable having women in the chess world and would like there to be more. So let's shift that conversation to what are the things we know works? What are the things we know don't work? And also what are the ones where we're not sure? What's the evidence we need to make a good decision? And then how can we get that evidence? So that brings me to the second half, which is about gender policies. There are three main policies that I'm going to touch on and provide evidence, like I said, not from the chess world. And then it's up to you to basically decide whether you think it's applicable to the chess world or not or worth trying. The first is about role models and peer effects. So role models, people that you look up to who are above you, peers, people who are similar to you on the same level. The second is about quotas, very controversial topic in gender policy around the world, introducing quotas. I know that FIDE has uh, introduced um, quotas for some sort of board memberships, Eva was telling me. Um, so that's going to be something I'll chat about. And then the third is indices, um, putting forward a cross-country index about a certain thing that we're interested in, whether or not that's worth doing. And with each of these three, I have a slightly provocative recommendation that I'll put forward that hopefully will make for a good talking point. Okay, so the first is role models. There's pretty strong evidence now around the world that role models make a big difference for minorities in competitive environments. Now, minorities in this case, we would say that females are minorities in the chess world. Of course, there can be other minorities in terms of ethnicity, income classes, and so forth. So having role models, people from your minority group that have achieved success that you can look up to uh, seem to make a big difference both for your performance and your participation in terms of reducing dropout. Uh, very recently, a high profile economics paper was published to do with the Queen of Katwe uh, movie, but it wasn't actually about chess, the, uh, the topic, which was kind of interesting to me. It was about mathematics. The idea was that in Uganda, boys are typically much better than girls in their high school math scores, and girls typically have a pretty strong um, failure rate. But particularly in those uh, low income or low socioeconomic groups, 
which is where the uh, Queen of Catwork character came from in Chess World. Um, uh, they introduced an experiment, a big experiment. I think it was run uh, around about 2000 students where half of them were given a movie to watch a week or a month before their exam, which was just a control sort of uh, movie, nothing special. And the others got to watch this movie that many of us will have seen, The Queen of Cabra, which shows a girl in a male dominated mathematical domain achieving great success. And just watching this movie had an incredibly strong effect, given that all they're doing is watching a movie, they're not getting any mathematical training. Girls were 44% more likely to pass their high school math score, which is just an incredible statistic. And that completely closed the gap between those girls uh, and what they would typically score against a boy. And boys who watched it also did better, not as a bigger jump as girls, but also did better perhaps because they're resonating with a role model in terms of a socioeconomic group rather than the gender necessarily. So I put that one up there because it's quite recent and sort of related to chess, but there are many other domains and studies that have been done that show that role models can be very powerful. Um, if you're an early career woman in different industries, um, particularly in ac ac academia or also business, and you've got a female mentor, you'll stay longer and you'll progress further in your career. There were some studies done in India where at some point they passed a law where one third of the community leaders or village leaders had to be females. And those girls who grew up in one of those areas where they had a female leader were more likely to pursue careers, pursue politics and delay marriage and children decisions to put their focus in other areas. And so that I'm not just talking about women as minorities all the time, because I'm interested in this in kind of all of its facets. Boys who've got, uh, so boys typically, as we saw, do very badly in reading compared to girls, but boys who've got male English teachers in the US around the ages of 12 to 15 do much better in reading and writing than if they've got a female teacher. And in fact, the increase is in a, about 30% of the gap between boys and girls. So a big difference. What about role models in chess? Well, I'll get to this later on with some of the recommendations. But I think it's important to note that these role models don't need to be someone who's specifically on that career track that you want to follow, but can be related to that industry in general. So in that case for chess, it's not just about having top players, but also looking at females at, at various positions in the chess world where you can look up to them with respect as a success in, in this particular stereotypically male dominated domain, which includes trainers, administrators, arbiters, organizers, commentators, and, and even streamers. Okay, now peer effects are slightly different to role models because we're talking about people kind of on the same wavelength as you, they might be your classmates or things like this. Um, there's a lot of evidence here that this also makes a big difference, particularly in um, if you're a minority in a uh, dominated environment. So if you're a woman in a male dominated environment, there've been some studies done in military academies to show that just having one more woman in your class makes a big difference for your promotion. Um, lots more stuff done in schools as well. You can imagine with stereotypically male streams like science um, and mathematics. Uh, and there've also been some anecdotal evidence from surveys that have been run to show that some of the uh, popular reasons given why girls drop out of chess at various points has to do with these things like either having to train alone all the time, feeling that they don't get that same sort of uh, friendship group where the boys are training together. So having to do a little bit more work, put in more effort by yourself, but also straight to that social element of feeling like you don't have that sort of sense of community as much. So those sort of disincentives to continue. And if we actually look at some of the most successful female players in our chess world, for most of them, we can kind of pinpoint some sort of peer effect or community support going on to, to, to help them. Not, not in all cases, but I'd say that there are many more uh, successful men in the chess world who uh, don't have immediate brothers or sisters or fathers, but can find those sort of peers at their chess club than for our top female players. Um, I wanted to break up all of my academic graphs by putting up some sort of pictures at some point. So you may recognize some of these players, uh, top female players around the world. Of course, I gave the Polga sisters the biggest, uh, <laughs> the biggest space on the page. And of course, we all know the story about this experiment that Laszlo uh, conducted essentially. Experiment sounds like a dirty word here, but it's not really, you know, he, he had this philosophy that uh, really 
uh, it's it's about that training environment. Girls should have the same chances. But the main point I want to make is not his philosophy, but the fact that Judith grew up in a house with two sisters, her peers, who are good chess players, and also kind of role models as well. Of course, we've got the Muzichuk sisters there. We've got Vaishali, the sister of Praga. A couple of others you may or may not recognize because I've gone back a bit in time. We've got Lizzie Petz, the strongest German player in the bottom right there. A very cute photo of her, but of course her, her father, Thomas, uh, a grandmaster, and her brother, Thomas Jr., a very strong player. So brought up already in that environment. Right at the top on the right, for anyone from England who's uh, uh, listening in, we've got uh, the Hunts, Harriet and Adam. And then in the middle on the right, we've got the Van Forest uh, family. Um, Agar, I think the daughter is actually playing in the tournament that you're arbiting, uh, Machteld uh, Van Forest. Um, so on the bottom right there, very cute little photo. I think she's a little bit older now, um, but she's you know one of the top girls in her age um, in the world and obviously brought up in that sort of environment again. So we're seeing a lot of examples of success that are correlated with having either peers or role models or both naturally in your environment and um, it's anecdotal and typically in my world i don't steer too much into anecdotal waters but i think it's it seems to make sense i would like to do some research on this topic and what what i think the point is here is to think about are there are there potential superstars out there who for just bad luck we're not brought up in this sort of environment where it's clear that you've got these sort of peers around you and for that reason maybe drop out rather than reaching their full potential. And if that's the case, if we believe that story, then what can we do about it to try to, to stop that from happening, to try to compensate for not having that natural male peer group? And that brings me to finally my first recommendation, which, uh, you know, it doesn't have to be specifically this, but one way to try and get around that is to artificially create that sort of peer network. So you could think of some sort of example where these sorts of girls who are extremely talented but maybe for whatever reason don't have that natural peer group, are given this opportunity uh, each year being selected in some sort of scholarship program to go in person to essentially a training camp or an academy retreat, call it whatever you will, for strong female players around the world. So they're meeting their peers in person, they're spending an intensive period of time together where they're able to forge these sort of social bonds as well as, I guess, pseudo-professional bonds. And you would imagine, given the research that we just saw on the previous slides, that it would be led and dominated by trainers, organizers, instructors who are strong female role models as well. So that's my first recommendation. Don't worry, I'm moving pretty rapidly to recommendations two and three, so I won't take up too much time of your Sundays. So we've moved on from peer effects and role models. Second one, very controversial in the general policy space outside of chess. What do we know about quotas? A quota is when, for example, on a board, which, which Norway did uh, some years ago, it said for every business in Norway, I can't remember the number, I think it was 25% it started with and then maybe went up. You've got to have at least 25% females on your board, on your corporate board. In the US for some period of time, it was much smaller. I think it was only two. You had to have a minimum of two. Um, but uh, what do we think about quotas in the chess world? Does it make any sense? Well, you can imagine that a lot of researchers have gotten their hands into this because it's an important topic, particularly in the US, but also in other countries. Evidence is actually quite mixed. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work, sometimes it doesn't really do anything at all. Rarely it can even backfire, not very often, but when I say backfire, we end up in a situation where it's made no positive gains, but it's led to some negative attitudes now, particularly with males finding this kind of unfair. So it's really done nothing positive for your group. Across all this research, we've managed to drill it down to a general rule about the situations where quotas can work, the situations where you probably don't want to introduce them. Now, if there's a pipeline problem, which means from the start, you don't have those numbers coming in and then nothing changes over time. So there's no evidence of dropping out or things like this, but it's just that you start at a very, very low base, then quotas probably won't work. But we saw back with that age graph where you could see that the share of females decreased pretty much continually all the way from age five to 65, but that's not the case. The base that we started at is pretty low, 25, 30%, but it's not that low and it goes down over time. So people are dropping out. It's not that initial pipeline situation. 
The second thing that's been identified is about stereotypes. If you can show evidence of some sort of social factors that are going on that are um, somehow causing uh, girls in this case to drop out at higher rates, then that's probably suggestive that quotas might have a positive effect. So if we think about all the evidence we have related to the chess world, it seems like a reasonable environment where quotas should make a difference. But of course, you know, you can't just put two factors down and assume you've got the answer. You'd want to really test these things to know for sure. So can we test these things? Well, just recently, it's actually been done. It was done from two very good uh, economists, um, Jose de Souza, who's in Paris, and Muriel Needley, who's in Stanford University, and they analyzed the French chess experiment. Now, for those of you in the UK, of course, you've got the Four Nations League, which also has a quota in terms of having at least one female player in a team. But the focus here was on the French data just because the data quality was a bit better and they could really look at some key outcomes. So what's the French experiment? Well, 1990, there was a big meeting of the French Chess Federation about whether or not to introduce quotas into their chess league. And the decision was put forward that every Division I club had to now go from not having eight players, but nine players where at least one was a female. And this movement from eight to nine, rather than eight to eight, was to make sure that you wouldn't put too many men offside, you know, by kicking them out of the team. They're still in the team, you're just adding an extra number. And there were some progressive increments in 1991 and 1992, and actually going into the 2000s, at some point, the French Federation actually withdrew this quota. And all those policy changes were used by these researchers to try to get some evidence about whether it was a good thing or a bad thing for women, women at the top, women across the board in France, women in France compared to women in other countries, and men. So basically looking at all these sort of outcomes to see whether or not it was any good. Now, the study that they've done is amazing, but it's very, very technical and it hasn't gone through peer review yet. So I'm presenting unpeer reviewed studies. So bear that in mind for the moment. These guys are very good. So, you know, they're, they're your, you know, 2,600 rated equivalent economists. So I have pretty good faith in their work. But let's see what they found anyway. What was the effect of the quota the quotes, when I say quotes, you know what I mean here about having to have at least one female player in your team. So what was the effect of the quota in France? Well, there was a dramatic increase in the ELO rating of the top 12 women, so the very top level elite, the ones who benefited the most from this effect. There was also a closing of that gender gap, that performance gap for the top players between males and females. And then this trickle down effect, which I guess we're kind of really interested in here, not just benefiting those at the top, which seems to make sense. They're now given a position in the professional league, but all the way down, we see an increase in female players. You can kind of see this dotted line at 1990, which is when the quota was introduced. We can see both the number and share of female players in France went up by a lot. And we can show that this happened at different age groups as well, um, particularly in the youth, um, in the youth brackets. What about the effect for France? Maybe the fact that it just went up over time is because women's participation was going up everywhere over time. In that case, you're just capturing some sort of trend rather than something that happened in France. Well, to do this, we have to compare the French women to women in comparable countries, so other European countries. And what we can see here, this um, horizontal dotted line, that red line is basically where you'd want French women share to be as a proportion of their population compared to other European countries. So they started out pretty low per capita to where they should be. And then they went up and up and up compared to other European countries before becoming well above average at some point in time. And the authors show a number of other graphs that seem to really suggest that compared to all other European countries in the EU 15 in particular, French women did much better since the quota. And what about men? Were men hurt by the quota? Well, they did the same sort of analysis and actually found that for men, which, are, which is the graph with the little squares here, it doesn't go all the way up to the top, like the French women do up to the top right-hand corner, but it's still a pretty increasing graph, showing an increase in uh, the performance of 
French men compared to other European countries and eventually getting above average in terms of their population. And they do a number of other studies to show that those men who were right at the border when the quota was introduced in terms of where the team leagues are, so the ones you'd, you'd uh, expect to be most affected, didn't suffer any negative effects either. So I'm gonna put this provocative recommendation, which is about four federations to introduce quotas for their league competitions. I like the way that the French one uh, did it, but it was quite gentle. You could see they weren't taking away positions at the start, and then they gradually introduced it to division two and three. And it seems to have a very positive effect. Now, even though this study is really well done and comprehensive, of course, there could be other factors going on that aren't explained here. And we've only got data to look at. These authors didn't really go in and interview people, get that sort of qualitative survey evidence. I'd like to actually hear from people involved in this in France and also from people in the UK and any other countries that have introduced quotas to get some sort of idea of factors to keep in mind, things that aren't obvious from the data. And that could be really useful for different federations who are considering introducing it. But I think getting that message across that not only is it going to help your women and your girls at all levels, but maybe even help your men as well, is a pretty powerful message when you want to try to encourage people to put uh, some sort of policy change in place. The last thing is about indices or indexes, depending on which country you're from and which sort of English you use. Now, what's an index or an indice? They're often called country performance indicators. You've heard about them in, in different, uh, I'm sure you've heard about them in different domains. Um, for instance, the Human Development Index, um, typically used as a measure of you know, developing countries versus uh, developed countries. Gender Equality Inequality Index, these ones done by the UN, as well as the Happiness Report. And other ones to do with corruption, environmentalness, um, social progress, uh, inequality, a whole bunch of them. So you've heard about all these before. Why are these indexes in place? They don't do anything specifically. So why are these big organizations putting time into developing them and publicizing them? Well, there's a lot of evidence that these public annual cross-country rankings have significant effects. And as um, Aga mentioned at the start, I work in social norms. So things that aren't sort of hard economic policy, but when these sort of social factors seem to matter. If you've ever been to a, a hotel in, in England, or I think in the US, sometimes you'll uh, you, you'll have to decide whether to reuse your hotel towel or not. You know, you put it on the floor, they change it, or you put it on the rack. And sometimes you'll see little notes that say things like 75% of guests in this hotel reuse their towels. Now that shouldn't do anything to your decision, but they put it there because we know that it does matter. Like knowing how others are going, we compare ourselves to people all the time, even if we're not being seen by them, it affects how we view ourselves. It seems to make a difference. What we find with indices around the world is that they draw more attention to whatever that issue is. You may not have really thought about, say, if we look on the left, um, on the previous graph, you may not have thought too much about the where to be born index, like where does your country rank on where you would like to be born or social progress or things like this. For some of us, we care about some of these things, but maybe not all of these things. But once you've got these rankings there that are given attention, it brings attention to these issues. It provokes conversations both within your country and also globally on social media, wherever else in the press, you know, these things are brought up a little bit more. And then it has a few harder components as well. Within some countries, it holds responsible parties to account. For instance, if you're the minister for environment in your country and there are now environmental rankings every year, then people are going to say something like if you start dropping down those rankings. So it holds people to account, but also gives them a measure of achievement that they can do if you do better in that ranking that you can then use to promote yourself and your achievements and your organization's achievements. And the last thing that it does, which is seems to be a fair bit of evidence about this, is that for those smaller non-government organizations within a country who care a lot about something, say that you're in a country that is a little bit corrupt, not very transparent, and you're an anti-corruption small organization, you probably don't have much of a voice or power in that country. These rankings help to empower you, may even lead to you getting more resources, more publicity, and making more of a difference. Why am I mentioning all these things? Well, I've developed uh, one index recently, which Aga mentioned, which is not cross country, but it's called the Fighting Chess Index. And I did it in response to a problem. The problem 
was about short draws in chess. I should say the problem is because it, you know, it hasn't gone away. But to my surprise, people took this kind of seriously. I put a lot of effort into this ranking. You know, I, I'm not going to say that it's perfect, but it's let's just say it, it, it's pretty good. It's pretty objective. It got a lot of feedback, almost all of it positive, uh, even by people who ranked poorly on it as well. They liked the idea of it. Organizers liked the idea of it. And to my surprise, this year, the Meltwater Tour contacted me and they're actually using it as, as three of their bonus prizes. So people are starting to care about it. Now, it's a pretty small thing at the end of the day, maybe this short drawer issue. There may be other solutions as well. But the power of just me writing on my blog to actually have policy changes is kind of what I'm getting at here. A few years ago, I wrote a post where I ranked the best and worst countries to be a female chess player. This wasn't a proper index. It was just basic statistics. However, it got a lot of um, attention in the chess media. And I had presidents of chess federations who I'd never met before writing to me, trying to explain their country's position. Now, why should they explain it to me? You know, I, I'm nobody about these things. But people started to care about this in some countries like Denmark and Sweden, which were actually ranked poorly, but pride themselves on, on you know, their chess histories. They had a lot of internal conversations about them. Okay, maybe not a lot, but they, they talked a bit about it. So these things do seem to matter in the chess world. We take it seriously. We use social media a lot more than a lot of other hobbies and sports, for example. So that brings me to my third proposal. Again, you know, it's I, I don't know if it's going to be taken up or not, but I think it would make a lot of sense for FIDE to think about publicizing an annual Women in Chess Index. And if I were to do it, the way that I would do it would not just be something as simple as what's your share of female players on the list, but I would try to incorporate a whole bunch of things together that we think are important and that we know are important in terms of role models and peers. So it would be things to do with board membership on your federation, ambassadors, like Eva said before, trying to get that promoted. It would simply be a component of the index, arbiters, trainers, all these sort of things together and not have it something concrete, like your funding from FIDE or whatever doesn't depend on this. It just sits there in the public eye looking at you, judging you, and then hopefully people do something about it. So that's all I really have for you today in terms of presenting the research that um, that's out there and how I think it might relate. A quick summary of those three recommendations. Uh, some of these things involve money. It's always you know, tricky to try to get funds for these things. And the first certainly does. It would be to sponsor an annual FIDE retreat for talented girls featuring role models with a focus on building up those peer networks as well. The second is for federations to consider introducing a gentle quota into national leagues. And if necessary for FIDE, FIDE to try to gather data and evidence from countries that have introduced it, put together some sort of um, report and recipe that can be provided to federations who want to do this. And the third to develop and publish a Women in Chess Federation ranking index. And uh, on, on that note, with those three hard recommendations put forward for you to think about, uh, I'll open the floor, pass it back to, to Aga. Wow, <laughs> David, that was awesome. That's really amazing presentation. You kept us so entertained. Then we have quite a few questions. The first one was actually, are these studies are global or only in some countries? Sorry, can you repeat again? Yes, Aga? are these studies are global or only in some countries? Ah, right. Yeah, I see now. Um, so some of the um, evidence um, is is done cross country. Like for instance, the one about uh, boys and girls and the comparative advantage on reading and science. These ones need to be done cross country. Most of the other studies, though, are done typically within one country. And then what we try to do in the field of economics, in particular, is to um, pick up as many of these studies as possible from different countries with different characteristics and sometimes even put them together statistically as, as a meta-analysis. So things to do with um, role models and peer effects, most of those studies have actually been done in either developing countries or the US. It's kind of strange like that, like not so much in between either developing countries or the US, um, but uh, it seems to be pretty, pretty clear, I, I think, Almost all studies that I've seen to do with role models, for example, show, show positive effects. I've never seen a negative one. So, I, I mean, I guess 
I think this is Nidal's question. I guess the point is like, how do we know what works in one country will work in another? With things like role models, it seems to be pretty clear, but it's a good question to do with say chess quotas because we've only got France. That's the only one that's been done so far. Okay. And um, the next question is the Queen's Gambit was such a success. Is there any evidence that this sort of shows can make a difference when there is a gender gap? Yeah. Um, yeah, so the, it's interesting to the Queen's Gambit, I would imagine in the future we will see some studies to do with some data on this because it's, it's you know, it's been such a massive thing. I think it was number one show in 60 countries, but there actually have been quite a number of studies done on what's called um, edutainment, so education, entertainment, where you look at different shows that have been shown, popular shows in different countries and the effects on social norms and behaviour. Um, one of the most famous ones was done uh, in Brazil, where one of the, the famous dramas there um, was easier to watch in some parts of Brazil than in other parts of Brazil. So that was really nice for running the data because you could see in those places where you could more easily watch the show what happened. And on this show, the families typically had fewer children, you know, the characters on a TV show, so they're fictional, but they had fewer children and the women were kind of, you know, stronger, more equal in the relationships. And in those areas, families typically started having fewer children and also naming their children after people in the show. So we know it's got to do with the show, but uh, it affected a huge decision, like fertility decision. You know, that's a massive decision, much bigger than whether to play chess or not, really. And there have been a number of different studies that have shown that these big popular shows can really change social norms. So no evidence yet, but evidence from other domain seems to indicate that we can be kind of positive about this. Cool. Uh, I noticed you didn't talk about price money or income in your presentation. Uh, what's your opinion on increasing price money in women events and um, or even more extreme major like equal price money? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, now prize money, prize money is a really interesting question particularly you know being an economist our, our default theory for everything is about money you know people do things for money and they'll stop doing it if it's not money the thing with um the thing with the chess world is that conditional on having the same rating women get paid more than men in, in most situations uh, for instance if you think about uh, the league league competitions uh, where say in the UK, you need to have at least one female playing, well, she's going to get paid a little bit more than someone of the same rating for that, that reason. Uh, and if you win the Women's World Championship, usually you've got a rating somewhere around 2,600 and that payday is going to be higher than your average 2,600 winning a tournament. Uh, so actually the situation is not, is not that bad in terms of prize money. Now there have been situations in the past where grants have been given for women's chess and that money has entirely gone to increasing prize money for, for women events. And I don't want to dismiss that because if you ask me, will that have a positive effect on women's chess? The answer is, is yes, for sure. More money is better than less money always. But the primary effect is going to be going into the pockets of the top players who win the money. The secondary effect will be through these um, indirect channels, we'll call it in academia, indirect channels where you might see a few more of the top players playing because of the high money, which increases a bit more exposure, which maybe increases that role model effect a bit more, but they're all kind of, we call them secondary as in like not the strongest effect. The main effect is money going into pockets. And some of these measures that I'm proposing, for instance, like a, a FIDE Academy or camp, it's going to be an expensive thing but the effect is more direct, I imagine. Um, it's, it's focusing particularly on those girls who are at that key moment where some are otherwise going to drop out. We, we know that. So I don't think it's a, it's a matter of, a question of necessarily whether it's going to be a positive or negative effect. It's going to be positive. It's more about where can you get the best bang for your buck, as we'd say, where are you going to get the best impact from your money? It's not clear to me that that's the best place to put the money. Uh, we are actually receiving quite many questions. Please do note that we will make a note of all the questions. We will try to answer as much as possible. But if we cannot answer today, 
we will keep them for the next meeting or they will be added to the recording later. Lilia, could you please record all the questions that we have, okay? Then another question is actually about the mothers in uh, chess. Uh, because the performance gap for mothers seems quite important. And what can be done to help women uh, with children to stay in chess? Yeah, this is, um, so like I said, this is work in progress that we're doing. And we have some very interesting survey responses from people. Uh, this is a survey I put out some time ago, which I'm going through where people give their stories and their comments. Now for economists, we typically just like to make graphs with data and don't talk to people so much. <laughs> so it's really great for me to hear this stuff. I'm trying to work out the best way to get the patterns of this together because that graph that I showed, uh, sorry, I should probably stop sharing my screen actually at this point. It's a little bit more social this way. Sorry. Um, yeah, so so the, the graph that I um, they showed actually is, um, it's pretty strong evidence actually that women, we already knew that women start to, that their quality of their move starts to go down around about the child bearing age, you know, when women have kids. And now with this extra evidence, we can be pretty clear that it's when you have kids, it, it's tough. And one of the big things coming out from this survey is that the biggest reason in my survey why women stop playing chess is a lack of time. Number one thing is a lack of time. And when you've got, like, if you want to stay really active at the top level, you're playing these two week tournaments where it's one game a day but you're not spending the rest of the day taking care of your kids. You're spending the rest of the day sleeping and preparing and things like this if you're a serious player. And what do you do with your kids for two weeks? So, so it's actually something that I, I didn't appreciate and, until I had children myself. And now I start to realize that um, it's, it's really tough. I, I mean, I, I'm not a mother, but I imagine for mothers, it's, it's really, really tough to stay both... Um, to stay at that top level where you were before or you're willing to play some tournaments but just see your rating fall and you know it's going to happen you may as well just drop out and say well i'm never going to be as good as i was and that's kind of sad so i feel that it's on we need a better system i don't know what the system is maybe it's as simple as making organizers aware of this issue when they design the structure and format of the tournaments either to try to accommodate them with some small changes or else design some other sorts of tournaments um, that are a little bit more friendly, but I don't have a good solution. I feel that we need to have some sort of conversation about the structure for this. Now that we've identified that it's a real problem, we didn't really know before. Now we do, I guess we could have guessed, but now we know for sure. I don't know how to do it, but I think we should talk about it. Um, then we have a question from Bar Rohan uh, raising the hand. Uh, let's give uh, Lilia, can you unlock, please unmute, and then I will give you the question from Susan. Hi, good, um, good morning. It's very early here in Barbados. Um, just a comment before I ask my question. I thought it was a very good presentation. I appreciated a lot of the elements, especially the aspect of gentle quotas, because I found we tried to do it a bit radical in the past and met resistance. So I think that's good. But one aspect I wanted to focus on is um, the impact of social norms, how society views women, view women as opposed to viewing men. Wouldn't that be a factor? For example, if I'm a, as a male, go to, I think you all call it a pub or whatever it is in England, and I go as a, as a single man on my own and I spend a lot of time there, there's no problem. If a single female or a female with a family goes, in our society, people tend to look down on that. You no, know, she should be a family, this family to look after what is happening to the kids. Whereas men get a pass because they have children too. But I go out, have a good time. But then the pressures on the female in some societies to be the family person. And I think that affects um, all of our chess players, uh, female chess players. And in addition to that, having children, especially in the Caribbean, if the tournaments, you have to travel, like our recent subzonal, zonal. Our top female player, she has a young child, but she had to travel. So then it was difficult, but her mother assisted in looking after the child for the week or something like that. But everybody will not get that, or will not have that type of support. So then I, I think those are factors as well. I don't know what's David's um, thought on that. Yeah, it's, I mean, that's great. Everything you say, I agree with 100%. Um, and uh, so, I mean, I've, I've never been to Barbados, but. Uh, I know that in, in many countries, 
where women's chess is, is still trying to catch up a bit, um, that's, that's a big issue. And quite often, for instance, I was in, um, I was in Kenya not too long ago and I went to a, a big schools tournament and I was shocked to see more girls than boys. I think it was, there were 700 people there and then there were like 400 girls and 300 boys. And to see more, more girls at a chess event was just, I'd never seen it before in my life. And talking to some of them, you know, and they were very good, very good. But talking to some of them, they said, yeah, yeah, I, I love chess. I'm going to keep playing as long as I can until I leave school. I said, what do you mean until you leave school? Well, well, I have to quit when I leave school, of course, you know, then it's time to, you know, find a husband and have kids. And, and it, was, it was so ingrained as like a default norm. None of them thought about going further. And one thing about Kenya and a lot of other countries is that, uh, well, okay, first there's the societal norms, like you said, that, you know, I don't know how the chess world is going to change those. This is a much bigger question. But second, at least within um, some countries, you don't see any examples of an adult woman who's, who's made a career in the chess world. And if that doesn't exist, then why should you change your default position? You think it's not an option and you don't see any evidence that contradicts it. Whereas in some other countries, you know, you see the, the Hoi Fans or you see the, the Humpies or the Judiths or whatever. So you know that it's an option, which at least makes you think about it as a decision. You know, you've got to weigh up the costs and benefits and it's not going to be easy, but you've got to think about it. But in some countries, it just never crosses your mind that it's possible. Yeah, so I agree with you 100% everything you're saying. Uh, yes, I, I would like to also uh, share with you some uh, my, my personal experience uh, uh, on the topic. Uh, first of all, I, David, this was such a powerful presentation, really, and uh, your recommendations we will certainly take very seriously. And uh, uh, what I like about uh, your approach that you, while you uh, presented this uh, gender gap research, you also mentioned that for practical reasons, it might not be that important, you know. Uh, we have uh, this feeling in our commission that uh, while we are working, uh, many people push us for a percentage, you know, when, uh, how, how many women uh, play uh, how many women contribute to, to, to chess community and we feel uh, a lot of pressure in this area but this is something a little bit out of our reach and maybe not even so important and uh, we need to focus how best support women who are already here to, to include them, to make them feel comfortable, want it, uh, support it, you know, and this is what we are doing, this is our mission and if, as a byproduct, uh, more women will play chess, this is only uh, good, but uh, it's, again, not up to us. The choice is on them. And um, as I said, that I would like to, to share with you uh, some personal experience. Uh, recently, I was reading a book by one of my favorite authors, and uh, although his stories are set uh, in fantasy world, uh, he is sharing some deep thoughts which are very much relevant to our society as well. And I came across something which reminded me of complaints about low participation of women in chess. It was a monologue by one of the main female protagonists, an extremely intelligent and accomplished scholar. And here is a short version of her reflection. Uh, what is a woman's place in this modern world? I rebel against this question although so many of my peers ask it. The inherent bias in the inquiry seems invisible to so many of them. They consider themselves progressive because they are willing to challenge many of the assumptions of the past. They ignore the greater assumption that a place for uh, women must be defined and set forth to begin with. A woman's strength should not be in her role, whatever she chooses it to be, but in the power to choose. So this, this last thing that it's not in the role, but in the power to choose. So let, uh, we need to let women choose if they want to be part of the chess community or not. So we cannot focus on, on this gender gap, on the percentage, but we need to focus on how best to support them, those who 
made the choice for chess. So, so this would be somehow my uh, uh, my feelings, and and I'm happy that David somehow confirmed it during his pre presentation how I feel about it, and I believe how many women in chess feel about the topic. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Eva. Um, Lilia, do you have any question to David? Maybe we can jump to the questions that are on the Zoom chat. Actually, if you want, like for example, Marina, yeah. Susan, okay. I saw that you wrote down in the chat, you can also speak here in the meeting. So if you- No problem. Then we have a first question was by the Susan Namangale. Do you share such findings with institutions that are also working in education, improving gender gap, mainly in STEM, and if they can be synergies to work with Federation on this and measure results in Federation where this institution could be working? Um, yeah, so in my, so a lot of the things that I spoke about um, are research that, that's published and, and in the academic community is, is reasonably well known and established now. One of the big problems with academic research is that there's so much of it and it, it, we talk our own language that's getting it to filter through to the people who actually can use it, like institutions in STEM, uh, governments, chess world, can be very difficult. And there's actually, in the last few years, there's been a lot of research done on different elements of chess. I don't know why different researchers are getting more and more interested in this, but the research never makes it into the, the chess world. So I'm trying to try to be some sort of conduit or in-between vessel for, for this. When it comes to STEM, like I said, it's becoming a bit um, a bit better, better known and that transition or transmission of information is becoming a bit better. Actually, two weeks ago, I, I gave a, a presentation to Australia's biggest uh, company, which was about um, gender uh, gender differences within companies hiring practices so when you get new you know new employees when you advertise for jobs and also for promotion and negotiations for pay rises within companies how to stop biases getting into the workplace um, which can actually damage the company's overall performance so it's not just about quality it's about you know you're actually hurting yourself with some of these things and that was based on different pieces of research that's been done so there is a pretty good um uh, appetite for that sort of knowledge in like the stem industry when it comes to things like chess it's just by pure coincidence that these researchers who wanted to research about quotas used the french experiment as some sort of domain in which to do some research on quotas and of course it helps us because the domain that they chose is, is chess so that's a bit of luck for us i think but i think there's still some more stuff to be done. And actually, um, so in general, I don't really have bad things to say about FIDE, I should say, as an organization. But one thing I wish there was a little bit more of is some data collection on different things. And it's not really FIDE's fault. A lot of organizations have this problem that they don't have the, the technical skills to analyze it or do research on stuff. So why should they collect the data? Most of the time, they don't even know really what data they need to collect. And it's difficult. You don't want to spend money hiring like a FIDE research person or, or whatever for this stuff. Although I know that um, Chess24 and Chessable, you know, who are pretty wealthy organizations, they are moving in this direction now. They've got a professor who's a director of research. And so they've got the resources to do this, which is great. But FIDE, it would be, yeah, I'd, I'm not putting blame, but just to say it would be a really nice thing if there was that data and maybe that appetite to say, okay, we don't know ourselves how to do the research, but we know some researchers. Let's go and contact the federations who put in quotas, collect a few of those statistics and some reflections as well from the people in charge. And then maybe we can do some of the things that, that Susan's sort of talking about, try to work out in what federations they're working and what not, and what are the patterns for why it works in one place or another. Then before I will give you some feedbacks, which they are really, really nice on the on the chat, uh, we have another question, and I think that will be the last question for today. 
and then we may respond them uh, after. Okay. Do you think that in junior tournaments there is sense to make no separate competition for girls? I mean, if girls are not separated and playing all the time with boys, the co competition is higher for them and girls can have better start in chess and girls' level of playing would be higher. And therefore, there will be more stronger women chess players. For example, in math competitions, there is never separation between girls and boys. Mm. Yeah, that's such a good question and difficult question, Marina. It's such a great question. I kind of, I think like most people, I have a feeling about which side I, I fit on. But one thing I've been trying to do with myself in, in recent years, since I moved full time into to research to economics, is to try to keep my feelings away. <laughs> and if I don't know the answer, just say, I, I don't know the answer, which is the case here. It's, it's a question that I've actually been interested in for a long time. And at one stage, I actually tried to get funding for a project that would, would do this. It was going to be um, with, a, with an organization that works in, in schools to see if we can, yeah, I mentioned experiment as a dirty word before, but that's the word that we use in, in research. So it would be kind of an experiment. You can also think about it like a randomized controlled trial is another name. In tech world, they call it A-B test, the same sort of idea. But basically, like, so to answer your question, Marina, I, I couldn't do it properly without evidence. And we don't have good evidence so far in other domains that are easy to kind of translate to chess either. So at the moment, I don't think anyone really knows the way to do it would be to get funding. Not much funding would be required because you have schools, uh, big organizations that work in schools with chess already. You just need to have someone kind of brave enough to put students into two groups, particularly girls. Some who are trying what you suggest, where they're just playing always in an open section, and some who aren't. Because we've got different effects going on. And you mentioned a few of them in your question, actually. You know, you see the competition is higher. You don't see any differences between males and females. So you, you don't have those stereotypes to begin with. And you just go straight into it um, with high benchmark in place. But on the other hand, if there are some biological differences, then you're going to feel that you're much worse than if you had the opportunity to play with girls. And if there are, if those social bonds and peer effects are actually really strong, then you're going to be missing out a bit on those. So I can see effects, push and pull effects in both directions. And as a researcher, I would just love to see such a project, such an experiment where we just try to find out and, and do it in such a way that the answer becomes clear because it would, I mean, if it comes out the way that uh, Marina said, suggested in her first sentence that it's actually much, much better to get rid of these things, then that would suggest a huge overhaul of the current structure of chess, if that's the case. Uh, so, you know, I'm not sure what we'll find, but the ramifications could be quite big. So it would be good to know. Lovely. Uh, we are keeping you engaged all the time with talking and probably you doesn't have a chance to read the comments. Then uh, oh, what, a okay. powerful, <laughs> what a powerful <laughs> presentation. Thank you, David. Great lecture. Thanks, David. Such a powerful presentation. Thank you. Very interesting presentation. Thank you, David. And we have many, many more of this. Every federation is uh, really grateful for that kind of research. And from our side as well, from the women, we are grateful that you could uh, prepare that presentation and give it to us today. Uh, before we will be um, heading off, uh, I think we will keep all the questions. Um, but, uh, thank you very much for your presentation and for your answer to the questions. No problem, um, my pleasure. Eva, would you like to say something before we go? Yes, yes, uh, so many thank you, David, but you were really, uh, deserve them all and much more really I, I'm impressed and and I, I hope that this is just a start so that uh, we must not forget that this forum is uh, about connecting us connecting people connecting all who care about women in chess and want to contribute in any way and uh, so uh, thank you all for joining and, and, and I do hope that we will be meeting regularly sharing ideas sharing uh, presentations discussing and just like david mentioned that uh, that um, um, uh, like those indexes they they are uh, made to uh, people to start a discussion and and we are also here to start a discussion 
which uh, we will continue and uh, uh, I strongly believe that this will lead to some long lasting results uh, uh, in, in your national federations and uh, uh, in FIDE and in the uh, world globally uh, as such. But again, we must not uh, forget, uh, uh, which was mentioned here as, uh, repeatedly, that uh, participation of women in percentage is uh, uh, one issue, but much more important issue is how to support those women who are already in chess. So let's focus on those topics and, and continue. So thank you, David. Uh, uh, we hope to, to see you again as participant uh, in our next forums and uh, we'll continue to share ideas and experiences. So thank you all and see you next time. We will uh, keep you updated and send you, uh, send you information about uh, uh, next uh, forums in due time. Thank you to all participants who came and enjoyed the time with us. I'm really looking forward for the next uh, meeting. Thank you, Chess24, for helping us on uh, preparation. And now I can officially close the meeting. Thank you very much, everyone. And, and thank you, thank you, Aga, for hosting the meeting and being with us. Uh, yeah. My pleasure, my pleasure. Thank, thank you, you David. Well. Thank you all for your participation. It has been a great session. Hi everyone, welcome to our new video series. My name is Jan Gustafsson and I'm thrilled to be reunited with fellow Magnus Carlsen's trainers, seconds, Peter Heine Nielsen, Magnus Carlsen's head coach and Laurent Fressinet, Magnus Carlsen's French coach, are both here and we will be going through the World Championship match 2021. Our experiences with it, the games, what we prepared, where we felt things went well, where we felt things didn't go well. Peter, we have different perspectives because we were in different locations. Very much. I'm looking forward to talking to you guys about it because you were in Thailand during all the match and I was in Dubai with the Magnus and the Theologics, his non-chess team. So I see it's some kind of debriefing where we will discuss what was the mood in Dubai, what was happening in the technical department in Thailand and we got to sort of basically compare notes and uh, yeah, get the two kind of inside looks uh, from the match. Very much so. And Laurent, we are actually in your private home. Thanks for having us. It's a big pleasure to, to welcome both of you. And I'm sure it will be interesting to talk to you guys about the match. Likewise. So we hope you guys enjoy the series with our behind the scenes insights. <laughs> See you then. <laughs> <laughs>